Hi, everyone. Thanks for carving out time to be at this webcast. We are so thrilled that leaders have gathered together all around the country today. During our time, we'll announce this year's summit faculty. Then you'll experience one of our most practical summit talks, and we'll give you space to network and process. Our hope is that this webcast will give you an opportunity to gather with leaders in your community and sharpen your leadership skills. Everyone wins when leaders get better. But we know that getting better as a leader takes intentionality. You need inspiration, you need training, and you need to connect with other leaders. Each year now, over 170,000 leaders gather worldwide to learn from each other at the Global Leadership Summit. This August, the summit will be broadcast from this very room, and then it will be experienced in 90 additional countries. What happens in the U.S makes it possible for us to take the summit around the world to leaders who are every bit as hungry to grow in their own leadership as we are. And you can count on the fact that behind every leader attending, there is a story of impact. Today, our team wants to briefly tell you why we're so excited about this year's summit. Take a look. Leadership is a craft and gaining mastery over our leadership skills requires intentionality. No one drifts their way into becoming a better leader. We hone our leadership gifts by placing ourselves in intentional growth environments. If you want to be a better leader, you need to go where leadership is taught, and the payoff is huge. The Summit team has assembled a world-class faculty of leaders from both the church and the business worlds to help you grow in your leadership skills. Each year I'm really excited to see who we bring to the summit because there's always new voices that you've never heard of that make such a huge impact. When I think about the level of content, we, we deliver practical skills. So it's not just come feel good about being a leader, but there'll be some sessions where you will take away hard hitting truths and practices that you can take back to wherever you lead. Hundreds of people have gotten fresh visions from God at the summit. And the main thing I pray for all year round is that we can organize a faculty and put on this event and people will feel the touch of God in their life. Leadership is increasingly complicated. Chances are that you have to rely on influence and not just positional authority to get the job done. Joseph Grenny is the author of four New York Times bestselling books and co-founder of Vital Smarts. He'll address the power of influence and the six sources of motivation that all people share. If leaders can tap into these common motivations, Joseph says that we can actually change the behavior of those who we lead. What he's known for is crucial conversations. Actually, I had a crucial conversation with someone at work. I went in, totally let it poorly, bulldozed the conversation, and I used Joseph's content to help me go back and apologize and and redeem the situation. So as he gets on stage and marries some of that with what he knows about influence and those six best practices to motivate people, regardless of where you lead, whether it's church, business, wherever, I think we, we all can learn from that. We have relationships with leaders all over the country. One of our field team members, Wes, attended an event where one speaker in particular brought down the house. Chris Brown is a senior pastor at North Coast Church in Vista, California. When our team sent the invitation to him, uh, we heard back that he did not believe it was true. And he went around to all the student ministries and were like, who sent me this email? Whose joke was this to invite me to the Leadership Summit? And when he finally called Steve Bell and was like, is this Steve Bell from Willow Creek Association? And told that story, we just got a big kick out of um, just his humility. At the summit this year, he'll deliver a message straight out of the Bible. Chris Brown will bring the story to life in a way that you've never experienced before. Patrick Lencioni, he's been a friend of ours for a long time. And the last two years running, uh, when he's come and spoken at the summit, he's been among the most respected and appreciated faculty members that we've ever had. So I got to thinking, why don't we have him a third time? Like, let's keep having him until he strikes out. So maybe he'll strike out this year. I don't think so. He is a fantastic leader, an amazing communicator, a winsome individual, and he's in the real world of leadership with companies and NGOs all over the world and tries to help them reach their strategic objectives. Then he takes all those learnings and brings it to the next challenge. Then he writes books that become bestsellers. 
because it's out of the real world. It's out of the stuff of leadership that he does every day. This is a communicator who bridges old and young and the business world and the church world. And he's just an exceptional human being and one of the best communicators I've ever seen. We all know leaders who bring the best out of the individuals on their teams, amplifying the gifts of those they lead. We also know leaders who inadvertently diminish their people. Maybe you've even served on a team with this kind of leader. It can be a painful experience. Liz Wiseman discovered that leaders who multiply the talents of their people share five skills. She will unpack those specific skills with us, and the good news is, any leader can learn these skills. She came in to do a webcast with us earlier uh, last year. As I heard her talk and identify like five different personality types, the content that she delivers is gonna be really practical and I think we're all gonna be able to go, oh, I'm that, or oh no, I'm an accidental diminisher. As we've worked with Liz, we've seen that these insights are powerful for every leader. Over the past 19 years since the summit began, we've noticed that leaders are compelled to take action. We are constantly amazed at what God prompts leaders to do after experiencing the summit. When screenwriter, producer, director, and humanitarian Richard Curtis spoke at the summit a few years ago, he showed a video he produced about a beautiful, young, homeless girl in a yellow dress. After seeing that, everything changed for Brian. Here's his story. Hi, I'm Brian Hopkins, pastor of Journey Church in Bozeman, Montana. A little girl in a yellow dress changed my life. At a Global Leadership Summit after seeing a film about a little homeless girl in a yellow dress who made her bed on the streets, my whole world stopped. All I could think was, Hopkins, what are you going to do to make sure that little children around the world don't have to make their beds on the streets? I knew that I didn't have any credibility with the gospel if I was turning a blind eye to global poverty. Whatever I had to do, I was in. On a trip to Ethiopia to figure out how our church was going to make a difference, I was ambushed. I met three kids in an orphanage and had an undeniable sense that those three kids were supposed to be a part of my family. Now, adopting didn't make any sense for us. We already had four kids, but God had bigger plans. In the matter of weeks, we were the parents of seven children. Right now, 13 families at our church are in the process of adopting children from other countries. Nothing is closer to the heart of God than adoption. That little girl in the yellow dress not only changed my life, but the life of our church and the life of my family. Inspiring. How many of us have been motivated to make such significant life change after attending a conference? But that's exactly what God has been doing for almost two decades with the summit. As we continue to share the 2013 faculty, our team is filled with anticipation about the new stories that will emerge after this year's summit. Take a look. There are some leaders who lead well, they do so intuitively. They don't reflect on why they're leading the way they're leading. They can't even give an apologetic for the choices they make in leadership. Colin Powell is a reflective and thoughtful leader he is universally respected and admired, and he has a kind of sober judgment about him that you, you just come to appreciate that very few people have. He walks around with a presence that some of our presidents never attained. There's people who stand up a little straighter when Colin Powell walks into the room. And I called him uh, in hopes that he would come back live this year so that we could hear him give a talk and have me interview him afterwards. And uh, it was one of the quickest conversations I've had with a world-class leader. He, he said, Bill, I'd love to. What are the dates? I'm eager to come. And uh, I've had a chance to do some more reading and research about his latest thoughts on leadership. This is gonna be a fantastic session at this year's summit. Kristen, one of our team members, got a phone call from Henry Cloud out of the blue. He was just driving down the highway, probably stuck in traffic in LA, and he was thinking about the summit. It's so great to see speakers, how invested they are, and how they're already thinking about who's sitting in the seats and what their content's gonna be about, and that they're, you know, just pick up the phone and call us when they're stuck in traffic. It's, it's cool. This year, Henry will speak directly to leaders, giving proactive tools to reset the negative tapes that play in our minds. You've probably never heard this name before, but after the summit, 
you will definitely never forget it. As an active participant himself in the Kenya GLS, he has seen every summit video. This electrifying speaker led a tiny ministry in Nairobi, Kenya to become a huge thriving church with one of the best leadership development plans that we've ever seen. Oscar Muro is a God-anointed speaker who promises to leave the Summit community with a fresh understanding of the importance of how we develop our people. I remember the day when I got an email from my daughter Shauna, and she came across a, an author named Brene Brown. You know, she's done research in the field of shame and guilt and the kind of leadership environment that destroys people. And how do you lead by lifting people instead of shaming people? I think she's going to be one of the big surprise hits of the summit this year. I can't wait for her talk. I'm most excited about Brene Brown. I had actually tweeted her a couple months ago and said, your content on vulnerability is changing my life. And she, she tweeted back, join the club, it's changing all of our lives. Vulnerability, we view it as weakness, but it's actually the birthplace of joy, acceptance, love. Brene explores the interplay between vulnerability and empathy, and she encourages people to experience a wholehearted living, which means living from a place of authenticity. What she talks about is incredibly compelling and I think will strike leaders at a really personal, visceral level. When Gary Haugen, founder and president of International Justice Mission, spoke at the summit a few years back, admitted soccer mom Christian Chandler took up his challenge. Here's her story. Hi, I'm Kristen Chandler. I live in the San Diego area. At the Leadership Summit, I was challenged by the words, lead where you are. And where I am most of the time is the soccer field. I'm a soccer mom, which means shuffling my daughter to practice and washing dirty uniforms, going to games. But now it means more. It means saving lives through Kick for Hope. Four years ago, I took up the challenge to lead where I was, and I started Kick for Hope with three things. I had a vision. I had a copy of Nonprofits for Dummies, and I had the support of a few friends. Last year, 134 teams and 2,000 children showed up. We raised $84,000, which might not sound like a lot, but what that means is three wells in Ethiopia, malaria nets in the Congo, AIDS education and testing for over 2,000 children, and so much more. At the 2008 summit, Gary Hagen said, when we show up, God shows up. And I believe it's true, even on the soccer field. No matter where you attend the summit, people understand that they have influence. From a mom creating a nonprofit for soccer teams to a pastor leading his congregation to have a heart for global poverty. Our prayer is that the summit becomes an incredible tool in God's hands to inspire every leader's kingdom impact. One of the most frequent comments I get right after a summit is people will say, oh, you'll never be able to assemble a faculty next year as good as the one that we just had this year. God has directed the assembling of our faculties for the last 15 years. I don't feel much pressure about that at all. This is gonna be a fantastic summit. Every once in a while, uh, someone will contact me and ask for a meeting. When I saw the background of a particular individual, I learned that this individual had gone from being a virtually unknown minimum wage worker into one of the most successful Hollywood producers of our day. He's the producer of Survivor, The Voice, Shark Tank, and that the reason why he wanted to meet with me was because he wanted to take his money and his expertise and make the name of Christ better understood and appreciated worldwide through a television series that he was dreaming of doing. So I thought, are you kidding me? Who does this? and the person I'm talking about is Mark Burnett. When I asked him if he would come and let me interview him at the summit, he, again, he said, absolutely, I, I would love to come. Uh, do you think I have anything to offer? <laughs> I said, well, we'll get something out of you. I, I think you have something to offer. I love the fact that he's willing to take a huge professional risk for the simple reason that he wants Christ to be made known to a wider audience than is known now. I'm really looking forward to that interview with Mark Burnett. The next speaker embodies the phrase, lead where you are. Bob Goff is an amazing communicator and he has a great story that I think we're all gonna be so inspired by this year. After learning about the plight of trafficked children all over the world, he set out to use his skills as a lawyer to help those in need. 
to think that this lawyer left probably a very successful law practice to go help children in Uganda and started this whole other ministry, I think is humbling. In fact, he did so much important work in Uganda, he was named High Counsel, a formal diplomat to Uganda. Bob Goff is a New York Times bestselling author, and his new book, Love Does, is a powerful inspiration to bring God's love to a world in need. His joyous, contagious style will leave you inspired to lead where you are. If innovation isn't executed, it's just a good idea. So the challenge of innovation isn't about just having the next big idea. It's getting that idea implemented. Vijay Govindarajan, known affectionately as VG by his peers, is a world-class thought leader raised in India. Not only has he taught some of the leading business schools about the execution side of innovation, he's actually served for 10 years as an innovation expert at GE. What Vijay has learned is that the key to innovation isn't about just being a good leader. This August, he'll share his formula for innovation success, created from some of the best practices of companies known for their success and getting great ideas done. In my opinion, Andy Stanley is probably in the top 1% of effective pastors in the entire world. And uh, I just spent several days with him in South Africa. He and I uh, hung out together and mentored, oh, I don't know, eight or 900 pastors over the course of several days. His wisdom comes straight from his gut. I mean, he lives it. He works in the church every day, every week, every month. I had the opportunity to speak at his church at their 15th anniversary. And for me to be able to share that with Andy uh, was uh, very memorable. And to see how his congregation loves him and respects him, I mean, he's something special. We've had Andy at the summit in the past. Every single time, he rings the bell. I mean, he is a pure leader fantastic communicator. He's going to do an awesome job. That's a look into the world-class leadership faculty that our team has put together. I have the opportunity to do the opening session. The full faculty includes Colin Powell, Andy Stanley, Mark Burnett, Oscar Mariu, Patrick Lencioni, Henry Cloud, Brene Brown, Vijay Govindarajan, Joseph Grenny, Bob Goff, Chris Brown, and Liz Wiseman. You're a leader. It's your job to keep your passion hot. Do whatever you have to do. Go wherever you have to go to stay fired up as a leader. See you at the summit. Let's shift gears now and move your leadership forward today. For the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna hear from William Urry, one of the world's foremost experts on conflict negotiation. I had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Uri, who actually co-authored the textbook on negotiation that I studied at the Harvard Business School. In this interview, he described different practices that he has developed in helping leaders negotiate the challenges we all face when managing through differences. William Uri's interview is classic summit, meaty, substantive, and full of practical application for leaders everywhere. So take a look at this interview with Dr. Uri. So, Bill, you've dedicated an entire career to helping people bridge this disagreement gap, conflict resolution. How did you get started in this? Why, why did you give yourself to this? Well, I, Jim, I, I grew up, you know, during the Cold War uh, under the shadow of what we called the bomb, and I could never understand why, because of a conflict between two countries, however important, we were willing to put at risk all of humanity, perhaps all of life itself. And... As an anthropologist, you know, I see that at this moment, if we were to look back a thousand years from now, look back at this moment in human history and say, this is the moment of the human family reunion. It's a time when all the tribes on the planet, all the language groups, all 16,000 of them, were all in touch for the first time, thanks to the communications revolution, thanks to events like this one, where we've got people from around the planet together, linked together. And the question to me is, like many family reunions, it's not all peace and light. I mean, there's some conflict, you know, there's some injustice, there's some inequity, there's some resentment. And the question is, how do we learn to live with each other? How do we learn to deal with our deepest differences? That's the question that I've devoted my life to. Hmm. Well, and why is this topic, why do you think this topic is relevant for everybody? I mean, some might say, hey, I'm not a negotiator, this is not for me. Right. You beg to differ. Yeah. I do, why? because I see negotiation very broadly as the act of back and forth communication. You're trying to reach agreement. 
You have some interests which you hold in common, like an ongoing relationship, mm. and you have other interests which are intention. Now think about it for a moment. Think about your own lives. Think about who you negotiate with in the course of your day. You know, your family, you know, your spouse, your kids, you know, your parents. You go into workplace, your colleagues, your associates, your board, your congregation, you know, vendors, constituents, governments. Think about if you had to make a ballpark estimate, think about how much time you spend engaged, roughly speaking, in the act of back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement on some issue, however small. Just a ballpark figure, what's the percentage? How many of you would, would say it's at least a quarter of my percent? Put up your hand if you, if it's at least a quarter, a quarter of your time you spend engaged back and forth in that process, if you wouldn't mind just putting up your hands there. Okay, I see a lot of hands go up. Keep your hands up if it's over half your time. You know, it's whatever percentage of it is, we're negotiating literally from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. We may not think of it as negotiation. Yeah. And if you think about, say, the 10 most important decisions you had to make in the last year, the ones that really affected your church, your organization, how many of those could you just make by yourself, just unilaterally? Mm. And how many of them did you actually have to make with someone else yeah. through some process of shared decision making, something we might call negotiation? I think most of them, maybe all of them. So negotiation has become the preeminent process for making decisions, whether it's in family, in church, in work life, in the larger community. And that's why negotiation is so central. Hmm. It's maybe the core competence, really a core competence for leadership. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think you mentioned in your book also that, that today we have flatter organizations. And so people don't always have authority over the people that they need to do some things with. And so they have to negotiate across department lines uh, with other vendors, outside service providers, whatever. And when they can't do that, everything breaks down. Yeah, literally to get our jobs done nowadays, we're literally dependent on dozens, hundreds, thousands of individuals and organizations over whom we exercise no direct control. Yeah. If we're gonna get our jobs done, if we're gonna meet, be successful, we need to negotiate. Right, and, and I thought it was very interesting that you say that the goal isn't the elimination of conflict, because you actually see that conflict can be constructive. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, conflict isn't necessarily something bad, it's something natural, I mean, we need conflict in life. I mean, no injustice, no unfairness in the world ever gets addressed without some kind of conflict. In business, you know, competition is what makes, what makes it work. Uh, in politics, we need, in, in democracy, we need to hear lots of different views that are very different. Yeah. We need to find, so the choice isn't about eliminating conflict. The choice is, can we deal with the conflicts in a constructive way, through honest dialogue, negotiation, trying to reach solutions that work for everyone, or are we going to do it through destruction? Yeah, right. Okay, so let's get right to that. In your experience, what is the thing that is, is the greatest obstacle to success in negotiation? Well, interestingly, you know, in the more than three decades since Roger Fisher and I collaborated on getting the yes, the thing that struck me most, the single biggest obstacle to us getting what we need in a negotiation is not what we think it is. It's not that difficult person, the difficult board member, the difficult congregation member. It's not that person. It's right here. It's ourselves. Hmm. We are the biggest barrier to us achieving success because it's a very natural, human, all too understandable tendency to react. In other words, to act without thinking. As the old saying goes, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, think about this in terms of email nowadays, because a lot of it's handled by email. We get emails. Email is a good way maybe to communicate information. But we get a lot of emails. We see an email that makes us angry. The most tempting button on that screen is that reply button. So yeah. we, you know, it's instant. You just get that instant satisfaction. What's worse is you hit the reply all, all button. button. <laughs> and then suddenly everyone gets that email and you start to see conflicts escalate. Yeah. You know, the most important button on that screen is the one that we never use is that one that says save as draft. You know, <laughs> you write it, and then you, you go for a walk around the block, you, you talk to a friend. The success, the key, the key foundation of successful negotiation is this ability to go, I use the metaphor of going to the balcony. It's almost as if you're negotiating on a stage. Part of your mind goes to an, a mental, emotional, a spiritual balcony, some place where you can get a larger perspective, a place of clarity, as Patrick was just mentioning. Mm -hmm. 
a place of clarity where you can keep your eyes on the prize. What, why are we here? What are we really trying to achieve? And that's, that's what's key. If I could just give you a personal story just for a, sure. an example. A uh, number of years ago, I was working in the country, as you mentioned, of Venezuela. Uh, there were a million people on the streets calling for the downfall of the president, President Chavez. A million people were on the streets for him. The country was bitterly polarized, and I was involved as a third party working with President Carter, actually. And at one point, I had a meeting with the president. Nine o'clock, he liked to work at night in his presidential palace. I go there and I wait patiently, and 9.30, 10, 10.30, 11. Finally, at midnight, I'm ushered in to see the president, expecting to find him alone, and in fact, he's got his entire cabinet arrayed behind him. He says, so, Bill, how have things been going? And I said, well, Mr. President, I've been talking to your government ministers, I've been talking to the opposition, it seems to me you're making some progress. He said, what do you mean making progress? You're not seeing anything, you're being fooled, you're just totally naive, you're not seeing what the other side's doing, they're traitors. And he leaned into my face, very close, much closer than I am to you right now, and he started to shout at me for approximately 30 minutes. Wow. Now... <laughs> I'm there, Did and he I'm have thinking. Machete? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost. I'm there, and I'm thinking. I'm not naive, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, you're kind of feeling embarrassed on the spot. You know, all this work is going down the drain. You know, your mind's going through that, and then I remember. Wait a minute. You know, I'm just about to get into an argument. I say, wait a minute. Is it in my interest to go to get into an argument with the president of, president of Venezuela? And I was able just to go to the balcony, and I pinched the palm of my hand. You know, give me a little bit of uh, pain, to keep me alert. And I said, no, I'll just listen to him. So I just listened to him. And after 30 minutes, you can only go on for so long if someone's not, you know, feeding fuel to the fire. After 30 minutes, his shoulders kind of sagged a little bit and a little weary tone of voice, he said to me, so Yuri, what should I do? Hmm. <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, I think the entire country needs to go to the balcony. Because, you know, it was almost Christmas, the previous Christmas, all the festivities had been canceled because of the conflict. I said, give everyone a break. Let everyone go spend Christmas with their families. We'll come back in January. We'll resume the conversations then. He said, that's a great idea. In fact, you know, while I'm going around Christmas visiting the country, you should come with me and see the country. He said, but wait a minute, you're a neutral. No problem, I'll give you a disguise. <laughs> a disguise. But, <laughs> but what the, a disguise. But the... Uh, the, the thing was, what I learned from that is maybe one of the greatest powers that we have in negotiation is the power not to react. Hmm. It's the power to get centered again on the balcony, remember what we're trying to do, and that's the foundation of successful getting yeah. to yes. Wow. No, I think it's true. Okay, so if those are some of the things that prevent us from negotiating well, and ourselves kind of being the first uh, on, on that line. What are the four things, what are the, the most significant things, the skills that we need to get good at to be, to be able to negotiate well? Well, you've got to focus on the people. We're human beings. We're negotiating with human beings. Mm -hmm. You've got to focus on their interests, their underlying needs. You've got to be creative, come up with creative options to address the needs of all. Mm -hmm. And then fairness, objective criteria. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve issues which can't be resolved easily? All right, let's talk about that first one. Let's unpack each one of those uh, a little more deeply. The first one about people, sep separating the people from the problem. Talk about yeah. that. The two most maybe common mistakes we make around this is that person's really important. It's a key customer, a key congregation member. We end up being soft on the people, and in being soft on the people, we end up being soft on the problem. We end up not mm -hmm. solving the problem at all. Mm -hmm. Or we make the opposite mistake. We think this has got a real hard problem. We've got to cut costs here. We're hard on the problem, we end up being hard on the person. And the people get in the way of dealing with the problem. Hmm. What you find successful negotiators doing is they almost like they draw a line in the middle of their head between the people and the problem so that simultaneously they can be soft on the people mm -hmm. while they remain very hard in dealing with the problem. In fact, the harder you need to deal with that problem, the softer you're going to need in dealing with the people if the people, their emotions, their egos, their personalities are not going to get in the way of dealing with that problem. Yeah. Soft on the people means listening. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, God gives us two ears and one mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's to listen at least twice as much as we talk. It's to put ourselves in the shoes of the other side. I mean, if someone were to say, what's the most important skill you need here? It may be that ability to put ourselves in the shoes of the other side. Mm -hmm. Understand how they feel. 
understand what it's like to be in their shoes. Because after all, negotiation is an exercise in influence. You're trying to change someone's mind. How could you possibly change someone's mind unless you know where that mind is? Mm. And respect. You know, the ability to show respect, which you often do by listening, to me is totally undervalued. The, the cheapest concession you can make in a negotiation is to give someone basic human respect, yeah. to listen to them. Yeah. Uh, because it costs you nothing and it means everything to them. Right. I remember resonating with that so much when I read that book some years ago. Because, I mean, as believers, as Christians, one of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. You, you don't want to be unkind to people. And so we struggle with, you know, you know, being soft on the person and then that also making us be soft on the issue. And when you separated that out, well, I can be kind to the person and viciously hard on attacking the problem and I'm not being unkind to the person. It really resonated with me. I mean, it's, it's changed a lot of my conversations and negotiations with people along the way. That's it, because essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to change the game from face-to-face -face confrontation, you know, right. where your enemies kind of right. staring across the table at each right. other, to you're both metaphorically, maybe literally on the same side of the table, side by side, tackling, tackling the problem the together. Problem. Yeah. But there's no reason not to be side by side and addressing the problem at the same time. Right, no. Okay, uh, the second one, focusing on interests, not positions. Unpack that one. Sure. Uh, most negotiations, they, they revolve around positions, the things we say we want, you know, the dollars and cents, the terms and conditions, the, the concrete things. Mm -hmm. But actually, what you're trying to do in a negotiation is address the underlying interests, the underlying needs or desires or concerns or fears or aspirations that people have. And the key in negotiation is always to probe behind the positions for what the underlying interests are. Mm -hmm. Because too often we end up with negotiations like the proverbial, you know, two kids who get into a quarrel about, about the orange. They each want the orange. And so, okay, finally we'll cut the orange in half. And one child takes her half and uh, peels the fruit and uh, pe pe peels, peels the, the orange and, you, and eats the fruit. The other one takes her half, peels it, throws away the fruit and uses the half of peel for baking a cake. In other words, we end up with a half appeal for one and a half a fruit for the other when if we had thought about what the underlying interests were, which were cooking and eating, we could have ended up with a whole peel for one and a whole fruit for the other. And so the key in negotiation is to always ask the question, why? Why is it you want that? Behind that position, help me understand what your needs are. That's what successful negotiation is about. Hmm. Okay, the next one. Um, Developing multiple options. Why is this so critical in the process? Because what's key, the thing that we bring to a negotiation is our ability to be inventive, to be creative. And once we have those interests, then we can come with, with creative possibilities because it may seem like on the level of positions, everything is opposed. Mm -hmm. But if we can look behind those positions for the interests, then we can ask ourselves, are there, there may be many ways of doing this. Right. I mean, give you an example. Um, uh, the, you know, from international relations from, from Jimmy Carter. I mean, when he was president, Israel and Egypt were at war with each other over the Sinai Peninsula, mm -hmm. where Moses, you know, received the commandments, you know, that, that piece of desert there, huge. And Israel was occupying the Sinai. Egypt demanded it back. That was their position. Israel was saying, well, we're only going to give you part of it back. We'll keep a third or quarter. You know, where's the line going to be? It was all about positions. But at Camp David there, what they were able to do is look behind those positions to ask, what are the underlying interests to the Egyptians? You know, why do you want the whole thing? Well, they said, well, our interest is sovereignty. The land has been ours since the time of the pharaohs, and we want it back. How about the Israelis? What was their concern? Security. Egyptian tanks had rolled across the Sinai and attacked them. They didn't want that happening again. So instead of just dividing, dividing it up somehow, what they came up with the idea of how do we meet the Egyptian interest in sovereignty, at the same time the Israeli interest in security, someone came up with a, a creative idea, which was, how about demilitarizing the Sinai? So that the whole Sinai, the whole peninsula goes back to Egypt, the Egyptian flag flies everywhere, but Egyptian tanks can go nowhere. So Israel got the whole Sinai as a buffer, not one part of it, and Egypt got total sovereignty. That's what you're looking for, is creative options that meet the interests of all sides. Yeah. 
I actually find this part pretty fun when you can sit with the other person or organization you're, you're talking to and say, when you start talking at an interest level and say, hey, let's just brainstorm some options on how we can meet the various interests. And now both of us are, we're like together a team engaged on trying to understand each other's interests and they get creative and imaginative about different possible ways. And it gets us away from that hardline position that, you know, uh, keeps us pretty much, if they have this position, we have this position, the only thing that's left is, well, you gotta cut it in half. Right. Instead of that, you can focus on meeting the underlying needs that develop that. That's the key. Hmm. Okay, last one here. Um, let's talk about uh, the power of objective criteria and fair process. Yeah, because through the inventing process, what you're doing is you're taking what so often we see as a fixed pie, and the question is how much of the pie I get, how much of the pie you get, and through the inventing process, you ask the first question, how do we expand the pie before we divide it up? But let's imagine now that you do have to divide up the pie. There are certain things like you want that lovely corner office with a view, and so does your colleague. Uh, or, you know, there, you know, it's a question of money. More for me means less for you. How do you deal with those situations in negotiation? Often, in a positional process, that becomes a question of will. We're not going to pay one cent more. We're not going to accept anything less. And you start to hear the word will in there mm. and ego, whether it's our own personal ego or the organizational ego, and it becomes, I'm not giving in. And then suddenly you're faced with a situation where something that you could have resolved in an hour suddenly starts dragging on for weeks or months. The transaction costs mm. go up. Neither side wants to give in. It has an, a bad effect on the relationship. What's the alternative? The alternative is to use standards that are independent of each side's will that are based on fairness, whether it's market value. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, a company, two companies I was working with wanted to merge, you know, just like churches and everyone companies, you know, they, they like to merge. They were two big aerospace companies. And it all made sense on paper, but then there was one question of which CEO is gonna be the CEO of the combined company? And where are the company headquarters gonna be? Because one was in sunny California and one was you know, thousands of miles, kilometers away in, in Washington, near Washington, D.C. And you know, no one wants to take all their children and move high school, you know, teenagers and all that. And so you know, that's where the negotiations were stuck. Now they could have handled it on, I'm not giving in unless you get, give it my way. But they said, no, let's look at what are some criteria, objective criteria of fairness? And they looked and said, we're both, you know, very obviously skilled, successful CEOs, but, you know, you're older than me. You're, you're, you're 64, I'm 63. So he said, well, that's the only one we can figure out. So the 64-year-old became the CEO until both companies had a mandatory retirement age of 65. That was fair. <laughs> you know, for one year, that guy was the CEO, then the second guy took over. And they said, okay, we'll resolve it that way. Now, how about headquarters? Where are we gonna make the headquarters? And they looked at all the criteria and they said, well, the one that's probably most relevant here is who is closest to the customer base, to the, to the largest bulk of customers. And, and in both cases, the largest customer for both companies was the federal government in Washington, D.C. So all those executives in sunny California, you know, moved their families. But what was interesting about it was because they resolved it that way, then in the merger, you know, all these different departments have to merge, you know, finance, law, human resources. They all use that same methodology of basing it on fairness rather than on will alone. No one had to give in to the other side. Mm -hmm. They just deferred to what was right. And so that worked smoothly. It was a success. And this company has gone on to merge at least 30 other times. They've developed a reputation for merging on the basis of fairness. And so everyone wants to merge with them. Wow. So that's their key competence. Yeah. Because no one has to give in to the other side. You just defer to something that seems to be fair and objective. It's a yeah, lot you easier. agree on the process, and then it's all yeah. about implementing that process right. we agree on. That's it. Yeah. Okay, it's not long, if you're reading any books on negotiation, that you're going to run into an odd term called BATNA. Can you describe what a BATNA is, and how is it different than a bottom line? Yeah. BATNA, which was a term we coined in, in Getty DS, was, uh, stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's your walkaway alternative. Before you go into negotiation, one of the biggest mistakes we make is we don't think about 
what are we going to do if for some reason we're not able to reach agreement with the other side? Mm -hmm. We might think, well, that's negative thinking, but it's not. It's alternative positive thinking. In other words, what's our alternative? Imagine you're looking for a job. Just take a simple example. And you have one job interview, and you have no idea what your alternative is. You think, I have no alternative. You know, think about it. You're going to accept anything that they offer you. But if you've taken the intervening week and you thought, well, what am I going to do if I don't get that particular job? You know, maybe I could go back to school, I could get some training, I could maybe find another job in another city. You do, maybe you have another job offer. It's even not so good, but you know, you have that alternative. You're going to negotiate with more confidence mm -hmm. because you have a BATNA, because you have an alternative. And so it's always good to go into negotiation knowing what you're going to do if for some reason you're not able to reach agreement. Mm -hmm. For one thing, the only way you can measure a good agreement is if it's better than your alternative. Mm -hmm. And you might seem perfectly obvious, but a lot of times people reach agreements that are worse for them than their alternatives because they haven't thought them through. Or they walk away from a deal that's better for them than their alternative. And so mm -hmm. BATNA is better than bottom line is a basic kind of indicator and anchor for us to feel confident, to have some leverage, to level the playing field to arrive at a fair agreement. Yeah, I felt when I started looking at BATNA, it was really useful because before you go into the conversation, you spend some time ahead of time preparing and thinking through creatively and imaginatively of all the different right. alternatives that you would be happy with. Sure. And at different levels of, uh, and, and you know, you have different levels of uh, happiness with each of sure. them, but you walk in there with that pre-knowledge to know if they push here, I've got these interests. Now, I know it's a subtlety because you say, well, a bottom line is if I don't get that, I walk. Right. But, but what's different about that, I, I thought, as I uh, learned reading the book, is that the position of a bottom line is not imaginative, it's not based so much on real knowledge about the underlying sure. interest. It's, I want $10. If I don't get $10, I'm going to walk. Right. And I haven't done any pre preparation sure. leading into that to really be knowledgeable about my interests to know if those buttons get pushed, I know how to react. That, that's it. So it, it's just, it just opens up the door in terms of being able to reach an agreement instead of walking in and saying, I got to get that number no matter what. That's it. And it focuses you on your interest because your BATNA is your best alternative for satisfying your interests right. rather than on your position. That's, that's it. Okay. What we all just experienced is the standard of what we're trying to do with every session at the summit. World-class teaching that's relevant to leadership issues and a high challenge factor. We're confident if you attend this year's summit, you'll be encouraged your skills will be honed and sharpened and your motivation to lead will be renewed. What we don't know is what God will do. That question and its limitless possibilities fuel us with incredible anticipation for what's to come. Make sure you take full advantage of the summit for yourself and for the leaders around you. Don't let it pass you by. Thanks for joining us today.